What about the role of progesterone? What what do you think the role of progesterone is in uh, both men and women for um, you know outside of reproduction, right? So putting reproduction aside, um, <clears throat> you know one of the things that we're doing a lot more with our patients. Um, we used to be pretty quick to abandon progesterone systemically if women were having, you know, any mood symptoms associated with a full dose of it. And we would just very quickly adopt a Mirena, you know, progesterone coated IUD to give the endometrial uh, counterbalance to the estradiol to prevent the hyperplasia and obviously reduce the risk of endometrial cancer with unopposed estrogen. Um, but, you know, we're really seeing a lot of women in the middle ground who maybe can't tolerate a full 200 dose, uh, 200 milligram dose of progesterone, which would be kind of the, the full dose, um, but feel great at 50 to 100. And so, you know, in many ways, what we're trying to do is just find every woman's dose and like, what's the amount of that you can tolerate? And if it's sufficient, great. If it's insufficient, we'll backstop it with a Mirena. Mm. Um, why do you think that is? Why, why do you think progesterone is so important for women? Outside of reproductive, like standard utility, I think that it's more like if you look at a steroidogenesis cascade, which is like in layman's terms, I guess, if you took cholesterol and then all of the different things it could turn into when you cleave it and through enzymatic pathways turn it into, you know, uh, um, glucocorticoids or like downstream to adrenal steroids and downstream to testosterone and DHT and estradiol and estrone and all that stuff like that is called steroidogenesis the synthesis of all these steroid hormones in your body and some of you guys might have seen this chart before and I'm sure you've showed it on the podcast it's like this big messy thing that has like 7,000 different pathways and it looks overwhelming but up near the top where you start to have like uh you know cortisol production you have some of this stuff upstream for um like glucocorticoids as well as where pregnenolone branches from like to actual androgens and upward to like adrenal hormones at the top you have this uh downstream cascade from progesterone that leads to an array of metabolite hormones that are like pro anxiolytic as in they will be like anti-anxiety kind of balance out the sympathetic drive that you might get from androgens and also help you get to sleep so that's why progesterone is so sure. useful at night and it's kind of why it's placed at that time for dosing as well and taking it orally also is like impactful on the way it's metabolized out to get some of these proportional metabolites too because if you had it in a cream or an injection not only maybe is it harder to get the dose you want out of it, but the metabolite content that you get is totally different when you have a first pass metabolism versus you skip it. So with progesterone in particular, it produces an array of different things, including but not limited to one is called allopregnenolone, which is seemingly implicated to some extent in post finasteride syndrome, but also very much in postpartum depression. And they've even created like a synthetic analog of it now that they use to treat postpartum depression which is interesting but all of those different metabolites cumulatively if you are deficient in you know some amount of them depending on the individual's biochemistry and genetic predispositions could result in like a you know more anxious human than otherwise so the dose required to balance out you know the uh androgenic signaling relative to all this other stuff going on I, you know, it's, I would expect it would vary quite significantly female to female. And especially when you are backfilling hormones from a shutdown state, like it's not endogenously regulated the same way when you have feedback mechanisms. So you're kind of just manually shooting stuff at your liver and hoping it's going to spit out the right amount of stuff. And you can only really do that through some sort of titration slash experimentation and what dosages seem to produce you know, repeatable outcomes in the literature we have available. So I would imagine a lot of women would, you know, have a dose that is far less to achieve the outcome they want or much higher or perhaps don't respond at all because it's not what they need. Depends. But I, I think that would be my my educated guess. Is there a role for progesterone use by men? Yeah. So I said this last time and you seem baffled and it definitely does not have like 
an approved use in men. There's no like literature that points to it as this is something you should use in men or replace. But I do believe and see it play out where it could be useful to balance out some of that sympathetic drive and whatnot. And it kind of, you know, you could look at blood work and kind of see, okay, in my like minimal negligible amount, should I be pushing that to the top of the negligible amount that is my threshold or. And what, what doses do you see people using here? The same doses, like 50 to 200. Well, that high. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the side effects of that? So if you are not on exogenous hormones, it is, it does have negative feedback. So similarly to most people are very familiar with how estrogen has negative feedback to the hypothalamus, pituitary, testicular axis, and testosterone through androgen receptors. But what often goes overlooked is some of the other hormones like progesterone. So progesterone isn't as potent of a negative feedback regulator that I've seen, but it definitely is. And it seems to maybe even have anti androgenic activity as well. And if it does that through, you know, competitive inhibition, or like, I don't really know off the top of my head, I don't recall how it does it, but it does seem to produce anti androgen like effects. And some of it may be mediated through the negative feedback. And some of it may be inhibited through actual like transcriptional activity, but ultimately it's something that will lower your ability to have like, you know, androgen like effects in the body to some extent. But if you're on TRT, it doesn't, doesn't matter because you're already shut down. Correct. So what would be the benefits when you're on TRT? Um, what is it helping you balance out clinically? I think very common we will see disproportionately high free androgen levels in men especially when you look at a lot of guys will look at their total testosterone their free testosterone their shbg but what often goes overlooked is shbg binds dht with i believe it's a five times higher affinity than testosterone mm -hmm. it might be 10 i think it's five though whatever it is it's much higher and that ratio of DHT to testosterone to estrogen that's freely circulating, like your regulating mechanism in the body, the primary one, because SHBG is like the main thing that determines how male you are essentially. That is, well, besides the actual production of the hormones, but DHT binds, gets bound up with five times higher affinity than tests, which is like 20 times higher than estrogen. So if you have that regulatory framework kind of like, Dr driven down through either a dose of testosterone that is higher than you need or like a i don't know super infrequent dosing pattern that results in like a disproportionate drop on certain days or an array of different things you could end up in this like free androgen dominant environment where your sympathetic drive is kind of like keyed up perpetually and because you have a long ester compound in your system you don't have the luxury of endogenous manipulation of your hormones going up when you need them and down when you need them like the pulsatile framework of your natural production is non-existent you're just like getting a big spike whenever you inject and then it's slowly going to diminish out of your system until you want to inject again and a lot of guys even when they're doing you know twice a week or something you're still getting like some level of spike and then dips and then spike and dips where if you were a natural with normal natural testosterone production it would be like very pulsatile with a diurnal rhythm with natural dips and valleys and peaks and it would not fluctuate where it's like bam bam and if you look at a steroid plotter you can kind of see how this looks and you want to compare a steroid plotter to like your actual rhythm naturally it's like not really the same so that's kind of where you get into you know more frequent dosing might be better but at the end of the day a lot of people are overlooking how dominant the free androgen profile could be in a guy on TRT because you'll see your total testosterone and it might be 700 when you measure it, but you're measuring it three days after your injection. You're looking only at free testosterone. Your DHT has not been evaluated. Your free DHT surely hasn't been evaluated. I don't necessarily think everyone has to spend hundreds of dollars to check those, by the way, but just be aware that if your SHBG is lower than it was before you started TRT, like there is a disproportionate regulating mechanism in play here now that you have to perhaps account for if you're in like a state of anxiety like that might be a factor or if you have trouble getting to sleep like there's certain cues i would look to as to am i you know a little bit too redlined right now